It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker of today, Professor Eugene Kandel, head of the National Economic Council in the Prime Minister's office and economic advisor to the Prime Minister since 2009. Uh, believe me, I have a long list of accomplishments that I'll, uh, I will not read to save the time. We want to hear Eugene. Eugene, the floor is yours, please. Uh, dear Modei family, uh, the President uh, Perez Lavi, uh, members of the board, uh, distinguished guests, distinguished faculty, students, and 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 staff, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored and humbled to 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 be here. Um, for first of all, in this uh, great institution, and in this occasion, following a list of very very great people that came and gave this lecture before me, so I'm, I'm quite humbled by this experience. By the way, uh, Professor Modai mentioned the, the 1985 um, uh, stabilization plan. Uh, it is routinely taught around the world in all uh, departments of economics as uh, one of the best examples of how to conquer inflation. This is your brother was... Uh, uh, was uh, part of a great uh, thing that really uh, put um, put Israeli economy back on track. On my way here, uh, I was uh, reminiscing about 1977 when I came to Israel. In November 1977, I was um, a second year uh, engineering student uh, in Moscow, and I was. Uh, offered to, to come and, and uh, join Technion, the, to apply to second year. And uh, I lived in Jerusalem, it was far, and uh, if one thing I learned about engineering is that I didn't like it. But maybe this was Russian engineering, I don't know. But uh, So I passed, and I was wondering on my way here what could have happened uh, with my life if I didn't. Uh, so um, it was an interesting thought. It was actually tempting counterfactual because as we all know, Technion is a household name uh, in Israel. Uh, it's an epicenter of uh, sort of the merger of economy and, and, and technology. It's the epicenter of the uh, ecosystem and of, inno of innovation. But in the recent uh, years, it became household name from New York through Gujarat in India to Guangdong in, in China. So this is now becoming a household name all over the world. You know, together we are a really big nation, right? Together there are a lot of people knowing the Technion name. And I wanted to thank all of you who worked tirelessly to make this happen because it is, uh, it not only brings uh, great economic potential to, to the country, but it also gives us a lot of pride. Thank you. What I wanted to talk about today is uh, sort of the Israeli government view strategic view on, uh, on, uh, on sort of this uh, innovation system that we are trying to, to construct here, which is not only in technology, but uh, throughout our, our existence. And this is what I call a whole of government strategic initiative. Whole of government is a term that I borrowed from Singapore, which means that bringing the government as one entity rather than silos of individual ministries which I must tell you from experience, a five-year experience, I'm finishing five-year term in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm not finishing, I'm just completing five years. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult. And strategic, it's interesting that uh, when, when uh, a couple of us, Chaim Shani, who is, by the way, a graduate of Technion, and I came to, to the government in 2009, we both asked the same question, even though we came from completely different direction. We said, who is sort of charting the course of this big ship, or small ship, depending, you know, what's your perspective, called Israel? And we, it turned out that there is no comparable um, sort of guidance or strategic vision to what we have in, in, the, in the military. In the military, they did it without the guidance, without the strategy, until 73. In 73, we got a slap in the face. And then the military decided they do need a strategic plan, and since then they've been doing it pretty well. On the domestic side, despite the you know slaps in the face, occasional slaps in the face, we didn't uh, we didn't do that. So Chaim and I decided to to do that, and we actually brought uh, brought about a, a strategic initiative that was trying to bring the entire government together 
which would be inclusive, systematic, and transparent. What it means is that inclusive, that it includes not only the entire government, but also the surrounding society. We want to understand, to bring the knowledge and bring the understanding and the insights from the entire society to this process. It needs to be systematic and not when we, we, we tend to, uh, as democracies, it's not unique to Israel, but we've perfected the, the, the craft. We only deal with things when they actually, when the ceiling falls on our head. Okay, when we see this spot, wet spot on the ceiling, we sort of say, well, somebody else will deal with that because, you know, there's no, no real, there are other ceilings falling on our head from the previous wet spots that nobody took care of. So that does not allow any systematic approach because, uh, because what it requires is that you need to do it fast, you need to, to it's, already, it's already political, it's already in the press, you know, everybody's pressuring, so this thing is now anything but systematic. I'm not saying that the government in its parts is not doing systematic things. On, like, this, is not, this is not the case, but as a government as a whole, it doesn't, or it didn't used to. And they're transparent, we have to be transparent, first of all, to each other within the government, but we also need to be transparent to the public, because the public today does not understand, A, where the government is trying to lead them, and B, what the government is doing. Okay, of course, it's a difficult issue of being transparent, because everything you say can and will be used against you. Not necessarily in the court of law, but definitely in the press. So, uh, we'd still, we would need to try to, to, to convey something that would be understood and, and appreciated by the public. So, what I want to do today is to show you some, uh, some thoughts on uh, what I presented uh, last year and will be presenting in two weeks uh, to the government of Israel. Last year it took me three hours. Since we don't have three hours and I don't intend to, to, to monopolize your time, I'm going to sort of do it telegraphically, sort of touch the, the top. What, what this is called is the uh, strategic economic uh, and social outlook for the government. And it essentially does uh, the following. It looks at trends uh, and threats uh, from around the world and local to Israel, identifies what are the implications and try to, to identify several strategic initiatives that need to be taken care. These are not, it's not inclusive, of all, all inclusive. There are other strategic initiatives that are taking place and will be taking place in the future, will need to be discussed in the future, but these are the ones that we chose to present. So following the crisis that, that we witnessed in 2008-2009, uh, we have entered into the age of great uncertainty. Before that, we were in the age of about 50 years of great growth, definitely in the developed world, which was interrupted by occasional uh, small uh, downturns, but uh, it was since practically after the war, Till, till uh, about now, between six, 50 to 60 years, depending on the country. What we are entering now is, uh, is a combination of several things that create great uh, uncertainty. The first one is that we know over the last 200 years, every financial crisis creates a breach of trust. The public no longer trusts the system. They don't trust the particular institution. They don't trust the system. They no longer feel safe within the system. And we saw it in 1923, we saw it in the 1930s, we, knew, we know what happened in some countries after these. We are in that era. Fortunately, we're not yet witnessing uh, such uh, cataclysmic events, but you know, the rise of right-wing and left-wing par parties, the move to the, to the fringes is, is evident around the world. We saw in this country protests uh, of uh, very large scale, we saw in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere. The second thing that contributes to this great uncertainty is the huge level of debt. We are at the historically high levels of debt. The previous height was after the World War II. We are about the same levels, except that then the, the reason for the debt levels were because the war was fought for four years, well, practically all the developed world, and uh, the GDP of the developed world shrunk. So you had increase in the numerator, de decline in the num denominator, that debt was understandable and it shrunk very rapidly as the economy started to grow and some of the debts were forgiven. We're not in that situation. We will have to reduce the debt by deleveraging, by paying it back slowly. When we pay that debt back, we have to reduce consumption. That slows the growth. And the low interest rates, which is the result of that growth, also bring us a lot of uncertainty. 
because low interest rates, they look good for investments, but if you're saving for a pension, this is not such a good idea to have low interest rates. And we have now record low interest rates over the last 300 years. They've been for five years at the level of below 1%. This is record high, a record low. And this is not going to change for a while at least. And then there is another danger here in the, when the interest rates go up suddenly, all the uh, fixed income, which is uh, like bonds and uh, uh, government bonds, commercial bonds, co corporate bonds, uh, their value will shrink. So we're facing another shrinkage in our, in our uh, pension uh, or long-term savings. This is one area. The other area which Technion has done some, some you know, contribute to, to this, that uh, revolution connectivity. I don't have to talk to this audience about this, but just to give you one, one number, is that when uh, in 1995, 15 million people around the world were connected to internet, next year there will be 5 billion, most of them with the mobile devices. What does that do to our ability to actually govern ourselves and prevent uh, existential threats to our infrastructure through the system, et cetera, et cetera? I don't have to explain to you, you know that much better than I do. We have growing demand for resources and this is again connected to Technion. Growing re demand for resources comes from the fact that more and more people come into the middle class. 300 million people came into the middle class in the last decade in China alone. These people want to have better food, better clothing, better apartments, better cars, appliances, etc. All of that needs to be manufactured, all of it competes for resources. Since there's a shortage for, of resources, we need to to make things more efficient. More efficient means that you need skilled people to, to manufacture, to, to create all that. So the biggest shortage in the world is actually skilled people. So the people that you are training, some of them are sitting here, within five to six months, with some searching, could be working between Australia and Canada and anywhere in between. There's no longer, uh, we're no longer in the world where our population is our population. We're in the world where everybody competes for everybody's populations, the upper part, the most skilled part, the most creative part, the most productive part. This is a great challenge, especially connected to put it together with connectivity. This is no longer one big village in which people move from house to house. Um, aging population is a tsunami that is coming to the world. I just came back from Japan with Prime Minister. 25% of the population of Japan is above age of 65. Okay, just for comparison, we're seven and a half percent. China is less than that. Uh, Europe is somewhat more than that. But we're all going that direction. We're all going to be there within a fairly short time. The number of people over 65 will uh, increase uh, by 100 percent in the next 10 years in Israel. We have to get, uh, get prepared for that. This is something we have a benefit of being a little bit away from that. But we're going to be aging very, very rapidly. This means that our labor force will be shrinking and their dependency ratio, which is the percent, how many working age people per retired person or per, uh, per uh, retired person and a child is going to shrink very rapidly. And the last thing is we have a revolution. Again, Technion has contributed to some of that. We have a revolution of bringing higher and higher computing power to eat away at a large chunk of the jobs in, in, in our society. And as the uh, Industrial Revolution ate away into the manufacturing and the agro-revolution ate away into the jobs in agriculture, we're now eating away into white-collar jobs that can be algorithmized. And this is... Uh, you know, this is good that, that the Technion is in the forefront of this, of, this, uh, 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 of this trend, but at the same time it poses a lot of, a lot of threats. Uh, there are some trends that are related to Israel specifically. We're a small and open economy. We're completely dependent on global markets. And given that the global markets are thinking or feeling a lot of uncertainty, this is, uh, it's uh, imperative that we, fee that we keep our fiscal discipline because any violation of trust or perceived trust of financial markets in the country will be penalized immediately. We are the, one of the two countries that have been, uh, the, whose ratings, uh, whose government debt ratings been raised in the last five years. 
everybody else, including United States, France, been lowered. Ours was raised. This is because we've been, throughout the storm, we've been very disciplined in terms of fiscal uh, affairs. We have to stay. We have no choice. We have challenging geopolitical environment. I'm not going to talk about this. I mean, uh, you know, those of you who are either Israelis or connected to Israel don't need to, 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 to be reminded of that. Um, there are demographic changes uh, along with aging that essentially we have a three separate population. We have an Arab population, about 20%, uh, ultra-Orthodox, the Haredi population, about 10%, and then the rest. These are three unconnected, almost unconnected, and separate economies. And uh, this is, again, I'm, I'm, uh, here I, I would like to congratulate Technion for the programs that are trying to connect these economies through bringing people, bringing people together. But these three, uh, three separate economies, we can no longer afford as a country to have three separate economies. We have to merge them without changing the nature of each community, without the changing the way of life of each community. We have to merge them into one economy because there's no other choice. And I'll explain on that a little bit later. Uh, the result of that, of course, is the low productivity in some cases because of lack of participation or access, unequal access to, to education and high inequality. High inequality is going to be exacerbated by the trend that I was talking about, the computer eating away at the middle, middle incomes. So the people would be moving to the sides, either to very high incomes or to very low incomes, not because they are their pigs and grabbing their share, but just because they are value, value to the society uh, in economic terms, of course, becoming higher and higher. Uh, these are the trends that we're talking about. And so I could talk more about the numbers, but I, I just want to summarize it into one one graph. If we, do, if we continue as business as usual, and we assume that the rates of employment and the rates of productivity of all three populations that we have will stay constant, and will just follow the demographic changes along, over time, which we know today how to predict pretty well, and we just extrapolate that into, into uh, the next uh, 35 years, what we're going to obtain is the difference between the government revenues, keeping taxes and, and, and expenditures and quality of expenditure constant, will start to diverge. Our uh, revenues from 40, about 40% 40 of the GDP will shrink to about 36% of GDP because of the shrinking labor force and because of the composition of, of, of uh, demographic composition, while our, uh, our expenditures due to higher pensions, due to higher I admit medical expenditures, given the aging of the population, will increase. So from 3% deficit, we will go to 10.5% deficit. Now you could say, well, you know, showing this to a, somebody, uh, usually in a political world, would say, well, you know, this is 19, you know, this is 2050. I mean, I'm not, this is 10 election cycles away. I mean, this is not relevant. The thing is that financial markets actually look forward, so they won't let anybody to go that far. Okay, we're going to be, if we continue on that path, we will be penalized, we will be cut out of financial markets, our ratings will be cut, that's not, that's not sustainable. Just, you know, that's what I want you to get from that. So how do you solve that? Well, there's one way is to shrink the difference. How do you shrink the difference? You lower the costs and you raise the revenues. It's very simple, right? Except that it's not, because Remember what I started from, I said that we no longer live in the world where our population is our population. Most of these revenues come from the upper part of the most productive part of the population. Now, if we shrink the expenditures, we will reduce the quality of services that the government provides. If we increase taxes, we will tax this population even more, which is already taxed. We have one of the most progressive income tax systems in the world. Now, at some point, think about if you're trying to squeeze between the higher taxes and lower, lower uh, services, I, some of these people will start finding alternative ways, alternative places to live. I mean, then you are shrinking your economy further and further. So you can't use that. You have to do something else. You can't do business as usual and just tax your way or cut your way out of this. This is necessary in the short run. You have to maintain fiscal discipline, but it's not a long-run strategy. So what do we do? Uh, 
Well, what we need to do is to compete not only for our markets, which is what we always say, we have to be very competitive in the international markets, product and services markets, but we actually have to compete for our citizens. This is the part that we need to combine. They are not contradictory, they are actually complementary, but we have to remember the second part. And what's interesting here is that we are arguing for strategic perspective. We are arguing that you have to plan forward. You have to think forward, not necessarily plan in terms of fixing the plan. You have to think forward all the time. You cannot live, uh, wait until the ceiling falls and until the threat is realized or the opportunity is already missed. But then there is a contradiction. In a world of technological change, where we don't know what kind of technology we will be using in five years, what kind of market structure will be there, how can we plan anything? Well, this is what I call how we... This is, this is in the world of innovation, and the answer is flexibility. Uh, I call it uh, our Iron Dome strategy. You can think about, you know, if, you are be, if a rocket is being occasionally uh, shot at you from, or launched at you from some place, and it's going to fall in some direction, you, in, in some place, in your, and you want to prevent that, you can do two things. You can either just run into in, in, undercover, uh, you can put a lot of cannons that would be shooting all the time. You know, United States aircraft uh, carriers used to do that against kamikaze soldiers. They would just shoot all the time. And when the plane would come, you know, in most cases, it would just get, get hit by an occasional without aiming at anything. It was just a wall of fire. Or you can, you can create an Iron Dome. Okay? Iron Dome is much more expensive because it's flexible. You built in the flexibility. But what you do, you plan ahead. You strategically consider all your options and then you allow the system to adjust to the things that, that, that it connects. And it has to be done on all levels of the society. It has to be done on the personal level. Our education system has to create Iron Dome people. They have to be flexible. They will be living much longer. They will have to do... They will no longer be able to say, well, I'm going to get into some firm or some institution at the age of 22 or 18 or 25, and I'm going to stay there for 35 years, I'll get a gold watch and, and retire. The, the life expectancy of the children that are get, getting into the first grade today will be over 90 years. There's no way they can work for 35 years. They will be in the world of changing technologies, they will be working two, three careers in their, in their lifetime. They need to be prepared to shift these careers and not to get into long-term unemployment. We have to get this flexibility into our institution and into our firms, into our government. Everywhere, the system has to be flexible to be adjustable to new, new conditions. This is, this is a great challenge to use innovation to understand where the world is going and to have enough flexibility in the system to adapt quickly. This is our, this is our comparative advantage. As Jews, we have done that for 2,000 years. We had to. We didn't have any choice. We just need to sort of make it into an, into, from an art into, into a policy. So this leads me to six strategic issues that we presented. One of them is uh, human capital development, growth engines for the economy, financial, uh, sorry, for the type of financial infrastructure. These, are three, the, these three are more geared towards being competitive vis-a-vis -vis our markets. And then there is population aging, preparedness, digital Israel, and housing strategy. These are more geared towards competing for the citizens. Of course, together they, they, they add up to a, to a strategy. I'm going to touch upon four of them that are relevant to, this, uh, to Technion. Human capital development. You know, when Toyota builds a car, it first goes and, think, and asks consumers what is it that they want. Then it goes and asks scientists what they can do. Then it gets to the engineering part, and tries to fig figure it out how they're going to do that. Then it, it acquires suppliers and coordinates between them and does a just-in-time system. And the whole thing is uh, seamless. Okay? And they generate a car that is then sold. Occasionally there are some mishaps, but this is, you know, this is life. If Toyota was uh, making cars the way we create human capital, and this is the most of the capital that we have, we have very little other capital. We have few uh, natural resources. Gas is with all the hype about it. It's nice, but it's about 1%, 2% of GDP. Now, later, it will be much less. So it's not something that, that uh, 
that 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 will actually change our society from 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 side to side human capital will and does and did okay this is what we that's what what we have and so but if we were generating physical capital in the way we're generating human capital it wouldn't work because we don't coordinate anything we don't ask what the market needs when we decide what is it that we're going to teach we're not thinking about this flexibility we didn't used to now there's much more thought of that but if you still go you know i just finished 20 years of education of my children in the public uh, education system from 94 till 2014 uh, and um, there's a lot of things that can be done differently and the interesting thing is that in the large economy where most of the systems are private and there's a lot of outlets and there's immigration policy and there's different industries you can sort of say you know things will work out and if they don't work out, if you have a shortage of engineers, we'll just open, you know, open our gates for 10 minutes. There will be, you know, 20,000 engineers will flood in and we'll close the gates and we'll solve the problem. Israel is not like that. First of all, Israeli government controls practically the entire process of uh, controls of finances and the entire process of uh, creation of human capital. From the school system to the army to the vocational training to higher education to you know, a lot of uh, labor market treatment, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we are much more involved as a government in this process. We have to be system coordinators as well. We cannot say, well, this is just going to just take care of itself. We should be like Toyota. This is not something that costs a lot of money, but this is something that needs to be done. Otherwise, we're losing a lot of human capital in the process. And I'll give you a couple of examples uh, just in, 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 in a second. This is another thing. This is the three populations that I was talking about. And uh, what I want to impress on you is that the levels of participation in the labor force and the level of human capital, the productivity of the Arab and ultra-Orthodox population are not sustainable if we go forward 20 years. We have to integrate these two populations with the rest. Just to give you an example, if you take 70% of the population, not the Arab population, not the ultra-Orthodox, the GDP per capita is about thirty-six, thirty-seven thousand dollars $37,000, which is above France. Okay? If you take the other two populations, GDP per capita is about a third of that, which is a little bit bigger than China. Okay? This is not a society that can maintain, especially since these two populations are growing much faster than the other one. This is the, the, what, what, you, what I show you here is the illustration of that. If you take people, uh, population age 25 to 29, the reason that I'm taking this number is this is the population that's entering the labor force. In Israel, you usually um, enter the labor force much later than in other countries, so let's take this representative. In 2009, there were 400,000 people in the, out of 70% of the population, 53,000 ultra-Orthodox, and uh, 111,000 Arabs. In this, uh, this is men and women together. So it's about the proportion of population, about 67 to 33%. If you go, if you do fast forward to 2029, it's tomorrow morning. This is not in terms of sort of preparing the systems. It's tomorrow morning. This is half and half. Actually, the number, the actual number, the absolute number of, of, of young people in the non-Orthodox, non-Arab non community is shrinking. This is demographics. This is, I, I got into a heated argument with a couple of ministers who didn't believe the numbers. These are people with, with IDs. This is, not, this is not a projection. These are people that are registered in, the, in, the, in our uh, population registry. So this is not a question of whether this is happening, you know, a little bit, maybe immigration out, immigration in. That may change it a little bit here and there by 2,000, 5,000 in each direction. But basically, this is a change. We have to make sure that these 300, 330,000 people that will be in their 25, 29, or today about 12 to, to 15. They will have their chance, their human capital, and their capability to enter the whole economy and not just stay within their, their own economies. One of the, th the illustrations of this need for coordination is given by this. Uh, Israel generates, Israeli universities generate uh, about 2,500 biologists every year. They generate, the Israeli universities, not the colleges, but universities 
generate about the same amount, a little bit bigger, of computer scientists and computer engineers per year. Well, with one difference that there are about 15 times more computer professionals working in the Israeli economy than biologists. So you're generating an annual increase of 30% of biologists and 2% of computer scientists. And you can, you can imagine which, in which one you have the shortage. Now, this would say, well, you know, this is fine. If people want to study biology, they should study biology. I don't have any problem with that. The only problem is that 65% of people that are graduating biology are women. 25% of people that are studying computer sciences are women. So we are already from the beginning, from somewhere in that place, somewhere from, high, from uh, elementary school through middle school, somewhere we lose a huge potential of half of our population. We can't afford that. I just said that we are, the human capital is the only capital that we have. You can say, you know, I'm not just going to look at half of the capital that I have and just sort of ignore them. I mean, this is not, this is not reasonable. I'm not saying that this, we, I'm not talking about equality there. I'm, I'm talking pure economics. Equality is important, but I'm talking pure economics. As a country, we just can't afford it. The second thing is that this, this, these decisions are not made after leaving the army. After, these decisions are by, by girls are made in fifth, sixth grade, when we manage to somehow confuse them into the fact that they don't know math and they're not good in it. I mean, that's, and so you, you, you should say, well, but, you know, if they're happier with this, well, let's, let's see. Maybe they're happier, maybe not. Because this salary four, four years after the uh, college graduation between these two professions is four times. It's 70,000 shekels a year versus 280,000 shekels a year. And these are just averages. Okay, this is, imagine how much, this is just salary, okay, there is a product, national product is much bigger. So think about of that person that is leaving from biology to computer sciences, how much growth it generates for themselves, for their family, for their, for their country. This is just an example of how we need coordination. Moving to growth engines. Just another, another type of, another sort of telegraphic uh, touches. Israeli market, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start from this graph. Israel has uh, an interesting position in the global value chain of uh, manufacturing and services. If you look at this graph on the horizontal axis, you have the number of people that are employed in, this, in the, each stage. Uh, versus a small number of employees or large number. So it's research and development and entrepreneurship in the left corner. Management, marketing, IP, lawyers, uh, accountants, what makes a big corporation, the big part, you know, customer support, etc. And then manufacturing and assembly. This is a sort of a lower, lower end uh, jobs. There's a huge number of people that are engaged in it. China and India uh, are in the, uh, in the right, ma majority in the right, moving into the center. I'm not saying that they are, don't have the high value added, that's not. It just shows where's the mass, where was the, where's the um, center of gravity of, of that country. Israel is in the other corner. United States is in both center and the corner, and Switzerland is very much in, I, I should have put it in the, in the upper corner, I, I ran out of space, but uh, it's, uh, it's, more, it's much more in, in, in the center. So we are very much, we have a very high percentage relative to others uh, of people who are in this uh, upper uh, left corner. These people are very well compensated, Lots of them come from this institution, but unfortunately, they don't generate any uh, leverage for the rest of the population because they are in these R&D centers or in small startups that then are being sold to larger, larger companies and then kept as R&D centers. This is great, we're happy to be there, but we just need to do in order to provide higher productivity into the center, into much larger population, we have to move into the center. We can't move to the right corner, but we have to move into the center because if we don't, the rest of the economy is going to be low productivity. 
This is added to the, to the human capital issue that I was talking about, that also, but from given the human capital, you have low productivity, and so you can see that we're about 23-25% below the average OECD and much, much lower than US and Ireland and France. Even though that our GDP is not that far from France, we just compensate by working much more. Uh, this is a problem. We had identified six years ago, uh, National Economic Council issued a pa paper which, and then uh, it was uh, run by a committee uh, that Zvika Eckstein was, was chairing about employment. We put all our efforts on increasing participation. Participation started increasing, it worked. It worked very well. Today, the participation has risen quite significantly. And during the crisis, we increased the number of jobs in the Israeli economy quite significantly. So the participation labor force increased and the unemployment declined. So there are lots of jobs were created. But many of these jobs were uh, at low level of productivity, especially since people who are coming into the labor force, with, which were not there before, are people with usually relatively low skills. So we had a reduction in productivity. Now our goal is shifting to less, uh, less, uh, still uh, emphasis on participation. This is not, we shouldn't rest on our laurels, but much more emphasis is to go in increasing productivity of these, of, of, of our workers. Just to show you that the, the discrepancy in, in productivity, if you take 1995 as 100% and do an index of um, exports in current dollars, current dollars, not, not, uh, not constant dollars, this means that in, in nominal terms, in 20 years, the traditional industry exports didn't change. Of course, the dollar today is completely different than the dollar 20 years ago. So in real terms, it shrunk significantly. Whereas uh, the high-tech exports grew in all the nominal terms five times. Okay, this is the, and if you see, if you look at the intermediate, it actually also grew. The higher technology, the more we are competitive in the world. The lower technology, we're not competitive. But the lower technology, this is the cost of living, right? These people are, these, these industries are actually giving us, the, selling us the services. It's one, one thing to, have to, to be competitive in the world. The other thing, you have to be also competitive for your citizens. So we have to lower the cost of living. Lowering the cost of living, we have to make our local industries much more, much more efficient. The another area in which new, new, new focus is that traditionally Israeli industry was not too focused uh, on emerging markets. And we're trying to change that. Uh, it's unfortunately not the presentation that I prepared last night, but I'll... I'll, I'll uh, um, uh, so uh, what, we, what we're trying to do is to A, increase, increase our reach as well as reduce the risk. Israel is a very, Israeli economy is very, very tilted in one direction, in ICT, which is, you know, something technion to blame, partially, but, you know, we're not complaining. But in terms, of, in terms of risks, we were very fortunate because the demand for ICT increased tremendously, and we were right there with prepared, with, prepared with technologies and people who could take, you know, take this right. But being so much connected to a one sector and to two regions in the world, which are actually not growing that fast, which is Western Europe and United States, which is about 70, over 70% of our exports, is dangerous. We A, need to explore other markets which grow much faster, and B, we, we need to diversify A, geographically, B, in terms of products. And we are trying to do that in uh, opening markets in China, in Japan, in India, in Latin America, in Africa. We are, uh, our Prime Minister was, uh, was in China last year. It was a breakthrough, according to independent sources that worked with China for many years. Uh, he was just in Japan, we came back, this was another breakthrough. There is suddenly Asia recognizes Israeli potential. Israeli capabilities in innovation, entrepreneurship, and out-of-box thinking, in chutzpah, in many things that they lack. And the combination between us and them, these are complementarities and not, not the competition. 
So we have just established about a year ago a dedicated uh, task force on, on China, which I happen to lead. And uh, we have just passed the government resolution on, on uh, uh, budgeting that and, and uh, creating a large potential for Israeli firms, a cooperation between Israeli firms and Chinese firms. Interestingly, we are using Academy and our technological scientific excellence not only is our comparative advantage, but as a door opener. You know, when you bring to, to the East, when you bring people that they admire to the East, they actually, you, you can actually walk in, after them into the door. This is an interesting, interesting shift that, that, we, that we would uh, really need to, to explore much more. And uh, Technion uh, joint venture with uh, Shantao, okay, with uh, Li Kaxing, uh, it's it's a great it's a great foray into in, into China. We're definitely going to ride on on your tails on that as well. So if you feel a little bit heavy, uh, we will be what? Can we send you a bill? No, uh, you can send me a bill. I'm not saying we'll pay it. <laughs> bill is is no problem. Um, all right, so, so here Academy has to be, and Technion is, is, is literally on forefront, uh, although some other institutions not to be named in this, in this hall uh, are doing some, uh, some uh, good work as well. Uh, third thing that is related to, um, to, to the growth options is financial infrastructure. Traditionally, banking was the main provider of financing in, in Israel. In 2012, banking, the entire banking uh, sector was about 900 billion shekels with, in funds that it could provide. The grown uh, financial market sector, which are the pension funds, the insurance companies, and, and others, were about 780 uh, billion. Due to the aging of the population, due to the mandatory pension law, and other demographic issues, what's going to happen between now and six years later is that uh, the banking system will grow between 2 and 4% a year in terms of funds available to it, whereas the financial system will grow between 8 and 11%. So it will become the dominant holder of finance, of, of re resources, sources of capital in, in, uh, in Israel. Now, so you say, well, what's, what's the problem? Well, the problem is the following, that banks have learned to work with the entire set of demanders of financing. They work with the government, they work with corporations, large, small, they will work with SMEs, they work with the public. Institutional investors, pension funds, do not know how to work with half of those. They know how to buy government bonds, they know how to buy stocks and bonds in corporations. They don't know how to credit or invest in SMEs, they don't know how to finance the public. But since they are going to have a lot of funds, there's a two-pronged problem. One, what are they going to do with these funds? They're going to ship them outside. You know, who's going to, and the second, if they do that, who's going to finance the public and the SMEs? So what is need, what's needed to, uh, is, is a system of transmission. It's like piping that would allow funds from institutions to go to everywhere where they need it. It can be done in two ways, either creating some kind of flow through banks, who already know how to do that, so the funds will flow through banks, or the funds will flow through independent agencies that know how to do that. So this is a challenge. We are in the middle of a large program that is trying to do that. Um, for example, in uh, rental housing, in uh, small and medium, medium businesses, in technology financing. So this is, this is very crucial to your future and, and past uh, graduates because this is, this, is a, this is a very serious issue that, that is being addressed as we speak. And the last thing is digital Israel. It is on the, on the, it's, it's on the border of competing for markets and competing for institutions. We, uh, we, say, um, uh, we say in Israel that Sandlar Olech Yechev, that, that uh, uh, the uh, shoemaker is, is walking barefoot, uh, we are a renowned early adopter of new technologies in, in, the, in the private sector. We're a global leader in various tech fields. You know, again, I'm not going to say it again that you have some, some blame for, for that. If we think about the government and the population, how are they utilizing these capabilities, we're not that far 
advanced. And so what we're doing now is A, providing countrywide broadband fiber optic system that will provide broadband deployment into every home and, and every school and every hospital and every clinic. We do have a unique knowledge infrastructure. Surprisingly, we're the world leader in the health data, in digitized health data. Nobody has anything resembling what we have just because some people in Klalit 15 or 17 years ago decided to, to computerize the whole system and today this system allows connect connectivity between every hospital and every, every, every doctor in the country. So we can utilize those, those knowledge, th this knowledge to actually address the difference between revenues and, and, and expenditures. What, what I'm talking about is that we need to provide services at lower cost and higher quality via uh, technological means through connectivity. We're talking about health services, we're talking about educational services. There is no excuse today to say that if a person was born in Kiryachmone or Dimona, they have to settle, or, or a small Arab village anywhere in, in Israel, that they have to settle for lesser quality teachers than, than the person who was born in Herzliya, or, or Tel Aviv, or, or Jerusalem. This is just no longer true. You don't have to shift people. You can shift their content. You can shift, you can, you can make every teacher in, in the best teacher in the country available to everybody. We just need to set up a system and to create an ecosystem around it that would make people feel comfortable. And I'm not saying anything new, but it's not new as a concept, it is new as an implementation, and we need to work on that. And so what, we, what we're doing is we're creating a beta site with companies like Cisco, like MS EMC, like Lockheed Martin and uh, IBM and others, which, which is to create a, um, an opportunity to link the government, the innovation ecosystem that we already have in ICT sector, uh, fiber optics, skilled workers, and multinational corporations to create two things. We need to create growth in those areas, and we need to improve services. All these things need constant push, because most of these things that I talked about are not in the job description of any single minister. Okay? They are not on the agenda necessarily of any single minister. I'm not saying that parts of this are not, do not, uh, some ministers care about them or not care about them. This is why I'm coming back to the whole of government issue. This is why we need to constantly bring the government together, bring it together with the outside, with outside, with the society, and push constantly to focus on things that will affect us in 10 to 15 years, because the political system never does that. In democracy, you never focus on things that will affect you in 15 years, because for a simple reason, because we as, uh, as electorate never elect people for something that they prevented 15 years from now, or something that they caused 15 years from now. We elect them from something that they've done in the last three years. So it's a backward-looking system rather than forward-looking system. We need a concentrated effort that will focus our country on its future. It could be very bright. Thank you very much.